covet your prayers. All right, ask Brother Sam Gipp if he would preach for us tonight. And so, if you want to come up, brother, we're good to go. Well, amen. Well, good to be saved, right? Yes. Good to be in church, right? Yes. Good to see. Yes. Well, it's always good to be saved, I'll tell you that. Yeah, it's always good to be in church. You know, if you can't make a good decision, go to church. You made one, okay? I'll open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 1. I am not preaching out of that. I just want to see if you have it in your version. You know, uh, I have got good news for everybody here tonight. This is true. This is true. God wants you to be blessed. Isn't that good? I mean, if you think about it, that's what you pray, basically pray, is it not? You say, no, I'm praying for a raise. I'm praying for, uh, you know, uh, my mother-in-law to not visit. You know, I'm praying. Yeah, you're praying, praying to be blessed. And... Um, this morning, the pastor told you how to be blessed. I, I, I'm a believer that truth is simple. Uh, I don't, you know, if somebody talks for a long time, they're going to tell you the truth. When they're done, you still don't know what they said. I don't think I got the truth. But um, uh, this morning, the pastor talked to you. If you want to be blessed, what did he say? Consider the poor. Isn't it good that God makes it very plain how to be blessed? In Revelation, there's a verse uh, like that. I, to be honest with you, I have another uh, message that I wanted to preach, but uh, God gets in my way. And, um, and so I'm going to preach the one that he wants, and it is, it is the one he wants, uh, and it is uh, how to be blessed. Uh, Revelation chapter 1, it says this, verse 3, Blessed, there it is, is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. Let's, uh, let's talk to the Lord. Father, thank you that we could be in church. Thank you so much, God. Thank you, Lord. Uh, we have just gone through eight dark years in our country, and I'm not saying that it's all over and everything's okay, but I don't think any of us feel as bad as we did uh, even a year ago. Thank you, God. The doors are still open. Thank you, Father. We're free to come here. Uh, we just thank you. Thank you, God, for the good health that you've given all of us that we could be here. We have much to praise you for. Now, Lord, these folks came because they want something from you. They want something from your book. God, if they don't get it tonight, it'll be my fault. So they need you, God, to get Sam Gip out of their way and out of your way. And speak to their hearts and accomplish your purpose. Uh, in each life represented, in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Uh, it is very simple. Blessed is he that readeth. Now, uh, I'm, a, I'm a believer that's talking about the whole Bible. Uh, you say, well, it's just talking about Revelation. Uh, well, we better stick with the whole Bible, okay? For some, several reasons. One, it talks about uh, reading it and hearing it, uh, and you need to hear the whole Bible, do you not? So there's three steps to being blessed. The Bible says, blessed is he that readeth. Guys, if you want to be blessed, read your Bible. That's all there is to it. Read your Bible. That's all you got to do. Now, here's the amazing thing about Christians, they, they, especially Baptists. Baptists have a way of snatching defeat from the jaws of victory. You know, they can find a cloud in every silver lining. And, and uh, you know, you tell a Baptist something and they'll tell you, you know, why they can't do it. Um, but I get this. People go, well, I, I, I read today. I didn't understand it. Who said you can understand it? It doesn't, does it say, blessed is he that understandeth? No, it says read it. Guys, you are not always going to understand everything you read in this book. You know why? Because the author is beyond you. You ever read somebody that's smarter than you? Now, for some of you, that's not hard. Um, but did you ever do that? Did you ever read somebody that is just, you know, like this? Uh, there's some books I read, man, and I'm just like hanging on by my fingernails to this guy's intellect uh, because he is so far beyond me, and I'm just kind of hanging on, trying to get something out of this book. And you wouldn't want to read it uh, if you saw it. But the Bible doesn't say we have to understand it. You're not going to understand a book that is written by a God that is infinite. Somebody that can speak a universe into existence and he writes a book and you're going to go understand it. Anybody, look, if anybody says they understand this book, they're either lying or there's no God. Isn't that right? You know, when I was in Bible college, I came to a conclusion. I'd just been saved oh, a couple of months. Uh, I was in my first year of Bible college and... Um, uh, and I came to this conclusion, and that is that if this guy teaches me, this course, Doc Ruckman, but I said, <clears throat> if this guy or anybody can teach the Bible without an error, they're God. And I knew he wasn't God. So everybody's got to have something wrong somewhere. So then, then the thought came to me is this. Okay, I'll find out where he's wrong, and I'll correct it. <laughs> then I'll be God. 
Guys, we're all, look, there's something you're going to think you understand. You're not going to get it. But the Bible doesn't say you, you have to understand it. Aren't you glad that you don't have to understand everything you read? Uh, keep your place here, but go to Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, there's a, there's a verse in here that has had me scratching my head for decades. And Ecclesiastes um, chapter 4, it says, uh, verse 15, I considered all the living which walk under the sun with the second child that shall stand up in his stead. Who in the world is the second child that's going to stand up in his stead? Now, please, please, if you never even knew that verse was there, don't come up after church and explain what that is, because I'm not going to believe you've got it, okay? But the fact is, guys, there's always going to be something that you don't understand. Personally, I like the fact that I understand this book in every, time, every time I read it for two reasons. Number one, it urges me to keep studying it. And number two, I'm, I'm telling you, you will never understand all of it. But we're not required to understand it. Aren't you glad for that? All you're told is to read. You will be blessed? Read it. I heard somebody say this. Uh, well, I read it and I didn't get anything. You know, I'm telling people to read the Bible all the time, and, uh, and, and uh, I, I can, look, I can understand. I can understand if I tell Christians to read the Bible and non believers hear that and say, oh, it's not important to read the Bible. It makes sense that an unbeliever would say it's not important to read the Bible, correct? But I know preachers, I know preachers that mock, mock anybody that tells people to read the Bible. I was talking to a guy named Mike one time. He's a King James Bible believer. He, Mike believed the King James Bible as much as you do. But Mike believed that it was not important to read it. Now, guys, that's like believing in steak and not eating it. You can believe it all day long, but until you start grilling it, that's when the fun starts. Isn't that true? And so I'm talking to Mike, and I said, Mike, I said, uh, I said do you believe that every word in this book came from God? He said, I sure do. I said, have you read? I said, I said, do you think it's important to read it? No. He said, I said, have you read every word in it? He goes, no. Now, look, I'm going to take issue with anybody in this room who says, I believe every word in the Bible came from God who has not read it. Because you have put your stamp of approval on a whole bunch of a space that you don't even know what's in there. Isn't that true? You better be careful what you say amen to. And so I said, Mike, have you read every word? He goes, no. I said, Mike, did you know that right in the middle of this book, it says, Mike is an idiot? He said, it does not. I said, how do you know? <laughs> if you get to Proverbs 26, he'd find out his, he's in there called fool, 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 fool. When I, write, I always feel right at home when I get to Proverbs chapter 26, okay? But guys, the Bible doesn't say that you have to understand it. The Bible doesn't say that you have to get something from it, all right? You don't always get something from when you read your Bible. Well, I'm not going to read it if I'm not going to get something. Guys, you're getting something. You're just not perceiving it. Let me ask you a question. Did you eat today? If you're a Baptist, you ate today, probably more than once, correct? Okay, is there anybody here that from the meals you ate today, you grew one inch taller? Well, I guess you're not getting anything. Better stop. Guys, didn't it keep you alive? Then you're getting something, aren't you? Guys, you know, you put that book into you, and you put that book into you, and you put that book into you. You don't have to register. You don't, you look, there, I've never yet... I've been reading my Bible, and like a light came on that said, okay, you just hit it. Uh, there's the limit. You just, you just clicked over into getting something. Guys, you don't always get something. Let me tell you uh, a discovery I made many years ago. When I was a little kid, uh, I wanted a glass of water. I'd push this uh, chair from the kitchen table over to the count counter of the sink, climb up on the chair, climb up on the counter, open up the cupboard, get a glass, push the chair back over to the sink, stand on the chair, uh, turn on the water, and get a glass of water. And then I got to where I didn't need the chair. I could stand on my toes and, and hold the water glass and, and, and turn it on and fill it up. And then one day I, I realized I was standing flat-footed, walked over, filled it up. And I said, I've been growing. And it wasn't the first time that I ever reached that, that water that easy. I had been growing and had not noticed it. Guys, you're not gonna you're not gonna read your Bible and, and all of a sudden go, oh, I just grew. I felt it. I just grew. What's gonna happen is something is going to happen and you're not gonna react the way you normally react. And that's when you're gonna look back and go, hey, this has been working. Putting this book in, it's been working. But the Bible doesn't say you have to get something every time you read it. 
Let me ask you this. Do you ever take a long trip, 200 miles, 300 miles? I will guarantee you, if you drive 300 miles, you will not notice every detail of that trip. Isn't that true? In fact, you could take that trip back and forth, back and forth. You could do that probably 10 times, and after, after five trips there and back, 10, 10 times, I believe you still will not have, have registered everything you can see on that trip. But the more you take that trip, the more you see. Isn't that true? Then guys, if you're reading something, you're reading the Bible and you're not getting something, then you know what you do? You read more and read more. You keep taking this trip because you will read that book. You ever do this? Get done reading the page and go, where was I? Man, I think there's a, there's a devil that you, you can look up and you go, oh, where was I? And you know what I always end up doing? I always end up starting clear at the beginning again, and I read down this column, down this column, down this column, and I'm three verses from the end, and the devil goes, next verse, that's where you were. <gasps> he would tell me now. And I just figure, well, that's what I get. So sometimes when I read my Bible, before I look up, I just put my finger here. Or I have a little, I have a little tag, and I stick it there. And, and then there's times when I go, oh, I don't need the tag. I'll remember. I, I grab my wallet, check my driver's license just to find out what my name is. Guys, guys, the Bible doesn't say you have to understand it. The Bible doesn't say you have to get something. Are you ready for this? You understand this? You don't even have to agree with it. You know, I'm just about convinced that most Christians, when they say the Bible is the word of God, what they really mean, what they don't add, the, little, the, the end of that sentence is the Bible is the word of God where I agree with it. Now, have you ever dealt with a lost person and you start like a Roman Catholic, you say, now, do you believe the Bible's word of God? I sure do. So if I show you from the Bible, you'll believe it. I sure will. And then you show them salvation by grace. They go, I don't care what you say. I don't, I don't believe that. Well, I've seen Christians do that. You've never done that? You never found a verse in here that you just said, I cannot sign on to that. I, I just don't like what it just told me. And all of a sudden, you don't, you don't agree with it. Guys, you are not going to agree with this Bible. You are not going to agree 100% with everything that God put in this book. But that's okay. If you want to be blessed, you don't have to understand it. You don't have to get something. You don't have to agree with it. You know what you got to do? Read it. Read it. You know, I, I, um, I know it's hard to believe. I don't go to tanning salons. But I know, I know how the process works. You expose yourself to a light and it has an effect on you, correct? That's what I think about every time I open my Bible. Every time I open my Bible, I just feel like I am opening this up and I am exposing myself to this book and it's having an effect on me. But you got to read it, okay? I was talking to a guy one time, kind of a doofus. Uh, he saved, saved, that's how you could tell. But, um, and, he's, and I was talking about reading the Bible and he goes like, he goes, well, I just like to lay with it open on my chest. I said, it doesn't get in through osmosis, bucko. I said, it's not printed backwards on your shirt when you get done. Now, I will be honest. I have laid with that book open on my chest at night. And I have uh, laid with it as my pillow. But, but that never got anything in. You know what you've got to do? You've got to read it. Hey, you don't even have to enjoy it. Man, guys, I read my Bible every day. I'm going to make a horrible confession. Sometimes I don't look forward to it. Sometimes I don't want to do it. Wait a minute, this is a book I claim to love. But I want to get doing something. I don't mean playing, I want to get to work. But I got to get my Bible reading done. And sometimes I don't enjoy it. Come on, guys, you enjoy everything in here? You don't read Leviticus 13 if you enjoy everything in this book. Leviticus 13 is about leprosy. Oh, what a wonderful chapter. I mean, it's about, you know, if, if you know, this falls off and you got this rising and this shining and this red spot and they lock you up for a week. Man, I tell people all the time, if, if you had a cold sore, if, you, if you're prone to cold sores in the Old Testament, you'd have spent a lot of time locked up. Because they'd have found a shining, a rising, a white spot, a red spot. They'd have locked you up and they went, oh, it's just a scab. Man, I have never found anything exciting about Leviticus 13. You say, well, I'll bet you're glad when you get to Leviticus 14. No. Leviticus 13 is about leprosy in your body. Leviticus 14 is about leprosy in the walls of the place where you're staying. And I have stayed in some of these motels. 
They smell remarkably like curry. But anyway, <laughs> I don't enjoy it. I, look, I understand the seventh chapter of Numbers, but my goodness, it's over and over and over and over and over. I don't always enjoy it. Guys, listen, I am confessing to you. I, I'm telling you, I love the Lord. I love this book. I believe every word in this book came from God. And there are times when I sit down to read it and I, I don't enjoy it. But it doesn't say I have to enjoy it. What does it have to do? Read it. Guys, you want to be blessed? Read your Bible. Just read your Bible. You don't have to understand it. Does this, make it. does this not make it a little easier? Especially if you're kind of like, okay, I don't understand it. Good, you don't have to. You don't have to understand it. You don't have to get something. You don't have to agree with it. You don't have to enjoy it. But you have to read it if you want to be blessed. You know what I, what I can't get over? I can't get over that the people I preach to in this church course, in every church I'm in, they're just like this one. Isn't there a, isn't there a group of people in our society that thinks the government owes them everything for nothing? And don't we disagree with that concept? But we have that very same thought about God. We tell those guys that think they want to get something for nothing, go to work and get something. Isn't that true? And yet we don't want to do anything to get blessed by God. We're just supposed to, just like the guy, you know, give me a blessing. Hold up the piece of cardboard and God is going to do it. Guys, you need to read this book. But look what else it says. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy then guys, you need to hear the Bible. Now, is that hard? I can think of three ways that you hear the Bible. An audio Bible. Used to have it on tapes. Uh, then they put it on CDs. Now they've got it on MP3s. I remember my first one, it was on uh, chiseled uh, stone tablets. But um, guys, it's not a bad thing to just listen to the Bible. Now, there is an advantage to reading. I'm talking about seeing the words of God. There is an advantage to reading the Bible that, that if you only hear it audio, there's something you will miss. There is a verse. I am not going to tell you that verse because my guys from Preparation Delivery are here and I'm going to make them find it. And so I'm not going to tell you where it is. Uh, guys, it's, uh, I'll narrow it down to the Bible. And, um, but there is a verse that if you hear it in audio, you will miss the word that you heard because there is a, there are two words that sound the same and mean radically two different things. But given that, and that's, that, I think may, I may, may have found two places in the Bible where if you listen to it, you're going to miss something as opposed to if you hear it, if you see it and read it. But guys, if you have to, ladies, ladies, you know, I've heard women, they say, I turn on the TV and I do my housework because I just need to hear the noise. What? You're not married? <laughs> you don't have a husband? You want to hear the noise? But why don't you turn on, a, why don't you put on the, the Bible? Boy, mom, you know what you ought to do? You ought to have that. You got a baby. You ought to have in, there, in that baby's room. Just have, a, have the word of God playing. You think anything's going to come of it? Uh, nothing bad's going to come of it. Isn't that right? I mean, I don't think it's going to hurt a baby to have the word of God to be exposed to them, even if they don't understand what the words are. So you need to hear this book. If you want to be blessed, you need to hear it. How? Audio Bible. Uh, the second way, recorded sermons. Now, I have recorded sermons. <clears throat> I have recorded sermons on CDs and DVDs and on the internet. And I have people say, you know, I heard, your, heard something you preached on the internet and it, uh, uh, and it was a help. And I want to be a help. But I never put one thing on the internet so that you would stay home on Sunday and listen to it instead of going to church. I don't believe for a second. You, you have no business staying home. Well, I, you know, I'm just not getting fed. Well, you know, whenever people say that, there's usually something wrong here. It's not here. It's usually something wrong there. Whenever somebody says, I'm not getting fed, I think what it is, they don't like to cook. But guys, look, you want to listen to something? That's fine. We've got a whole nation now that they have gone to the internet as their, as their sole source of spiritual food. Uh, and, and they've got pastors that they have never seen them. And I always tell those guys, I say, why don't you have one of those guys when you go to the hospital? Tell that Tell that video guy to come. Maybe he'll send you a DVD when you're about to have your brain surgery. And you can, just, you can just look at it in your room. It doesn't quite fit, does it? But you can listen to a, you can listen to a, uh, a, uh, a recorded sermon. Uh, I got a guy back in Ohio. 
uh, and he, is, he lives in Amish country. There's a lot of Amish people in Ohio. And he drives them. He's got a van, and he drives these Amish people. And, and every time I see him, he goes, uh, you got another DVD on that sermon on hell? <clears throat> Why? He said, because every time they get in my van, that's the only one I play. And he said, I'm just wearing it out. He said, if they're going to they're gonna ride with me, they're going to hear about hell. <laughs> but who knows, guys? Who knows what's going to come from that? Do you understand? And you have, I'll bet any, any number of you, you have heard a message. It was recorded somehow, and it was a blessing to you. Isn't that true? But you know, I think the best way to hear it, come to church. I thank God for church. I really do, guys. Look, I am not just, uh, just being like a... Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, a cheerleader for church. I believe in local churches. I really do. <clears throat> you know, um, there's some people out there and uh, you got these guys that they won't, they won't listen to anybody. They won't, they won't learn anything. They won't be taught anything. And uh, God called them to start a church in their living room so they can, can you imagine your old man preaching to you every day in your living room? I mean, I can't think of anything worse. If that wouldn't, if that would have you thoughts of suicide, I don't know what would. But, um, what the whole problem is, guys, and look, you know we don't have a pastor that is into this dictatorial pastoral authority thing. I know there are some guys like that, but you know what? There are just some guys, they won't be told anything by anybody. But you know, you just need to come sit down and get preached to. It's just good to sit down and get preached to. You know, I told, I told somebody to go to church, and, and, uh, and this guy said, well, I went, and the pastor preached, and it made me mad. And I said, well, did you thank him? We call this aerobic preaching. You come in here, we'll get you mad, get your heart beat up about 125 beats a minute, keep it there. We'll keep, you know, clear some sludge out of those arteries. You will live longer because you came to church. Now, you'll never thank us. <laughs> but guys, I figured this out. You know, uh, I write books, and, and if there's anything when you write a book, you know what you do? You get, if, if, you've, if you've got anything dangling, if you've got anything that is uh, a loose end, when you get to the end of that book, you have got to get all those loose ends and you've got to bind them down and, and tie them together, correct? Because the last chapter of a book could possibly be called the most important chapter of that book because that's where you bring it all together. Is that not true? Guys, this is the last book, Revelation, isn't it? Right? Oh, some of you think concordances. No, no, it's Revelation. Revelation is the last book, 66 books in this Bible. Revelation is the last one, and when you get to it, you know what you got God dealing with in chapters 1, 2, and 3? Local churches. Amen. You know what that tells me? That tells me that when, when this whole thing ends, you know the pastor was talking this morning about, uh, about the, the, the church age ending, the Lord coming back, us going up, then the seven-year tribulation starting. Right there, guys, when, when the Lord comes back, you know what I know? I know by reading this book, just by how he laid it out, I don't even mean the words of it, but how he laid it out. I know that when I get to the last chapter of this book, God's still working with local churches. You know what you want to do? You want to be affiliated with a local church. And just get in here. Uh, I say it this way. You need to come in, sit down, let somebody stand up behind this pulpit, open up that Bible, and rip your face off. And you do. You need that. Man, I remember, you know, I was preaching. I, I know, I know I wasn't preaching. Uh, I was on the staff of church back in Ohio, and believe it, I was not reading my Bible every day. And the pastor was saying, now I say 10 pages, he said 30 minutes. Uh, if you know anything, the average person can read a page of the Bible in three minutes. Now don't come up and go, I can't. Because I'll believe you. <laughs> but that is, that's not my statistic. That's just the average person. If you just, you know, half of you, the reason it takes you so long to read your Bible is your 15 minutes or 20 minutes trying to decide what music you want to listen to. Just open up the book and read. And if you just keep reading, don't talk, don't text, don't, don't uh, go through email or anything. Uh, just, just read the Bible, read the Bible. You can go through a page in three minutes, which is 10 pages is 30 minutes. So my pastor, he says, you ought to read your Bible for 30 minutes every day. And me, being a typical Christian who is not reading my Bible every day, I had an excuse. And I, I said to myself, look, it is one thing to be stupid. It's another to be stupid out loud. I know I'm stupid, but I try, to, I try to be silently stupid as much as I could. So I said to no other human being but my own brain, I said, I don't have time to read the Bible 30 minutes every day. And it was like the Holy Spirit told him. Because he goes, you don't have time to read the Bible 30 minutes every day. And then 
he cussed from the pulpit. I don't think a preacher should cuss from the pulpit. He said, get out of bed 30 minutes early so you can read your Bible. That's not cussing, nothing is. Oh, was I mad. I was so mad. I thought, he expects me to start getting up every day at 1130 in the morning just so I can read my Bible? <laughs> How unfair. Man, I am telling you guys, I am telling you, listen, I'm saved. I'm a King James Bible believer. I'm on his staff, and I am so angry with him that I walked out that night, and I went home, and I set my alarm 30 minutes, 30 minutes early, and I got blessed by what I heard. I've been reading my Bible every day. That guy got me. You know how he got me? He got me when he got me mad. Yeah, yeah, you come in here. Look, if, if I tell people, if, you know, you come here for a year. If you come here for a whole year and you don't walk out of here mad at least one time, do this. Because you have got to be dead. You need that. You need that adrenaline. I don't mean the rush. I mean you just need the whip cracked every now and then. And Because, guys, we're not, we're not doing everything that we should do. The pastor, th this morning's message, some of you didn't like it. And that is good. That is a good thing, isn't it? When a, when a pastor tells you, you have not arrived yet, man, I would not want to attend a church where the pastor said, boy, everybody else is a mess, but you guys are everything a Christian should be. I wouldn't stay there for five minutes because I know I'm not everything a Christian should be. I know I'm not everything that I, I should be. And you know who pushes me and prods me? The pastor, whoever's preaching, whoever he has in. I'm getting it from this pulpit. And I, sometimes I hear something I don't like, but it blesses me. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy. Now, guys, do you know what this is, basically? That's kind of like passive and passive. You can sit down and read. Now, you do have to hold the book. Occasionally turn a page. I know you may get winded, but that's really all. Hearing, all you have to do is stay awake, which for some of you, even that is an achievement. But really, guys, that's it. But then what does it say? And keep. Those things which are written therein. You are going to read this book, and you know what you're going to do? You're going to see something you need to do. I always like that. You know what I've found, and this is an amazing thing about preaching. A preacher can preach something, and somebody out in the, in the congregation will hear something that he never said. And that will change their life. You say, well, what was that? We call that God. You know what I think? Here's what I believe. It's this is what I believe. What I'm looking at you, here's what I believe. I believe that when you come in and you sit down here, when I come in and I sit down in a church, I feel like I am placing myself in a spiritual free fire zone. So what does that mean? That means when I come in here, I, somebody's going to get behind this pulpit, open up this book, and just like a, like a 66 caliber machine gun, just spray the whole crowd. And maybe, I, maybe I'll get missed. And maybe I won't. If it's something I don't need, I'll get missed. If it's something I need, always hits me right in the heart. But guys, you need to do it. Then once you, once you, once you hear it, you got to do it. You know, I, don't, I can't get over how many Christians think that mental assent is, a, is accomplishment. In other words, when, a, when the pastor says, like today, you know, he says, uh, consider the poor. And you go, amen, I agree. You know, that is not considering the poor. Well, I'd say amen. Well, give somebody some money. Find some poor evangelist <laughs> somewhere close. <laughs> but really, guys, I mean, you know, we hear, we hear good truth from a pulpit, and we say amen, and we say we're in agreement with it, and we don't do what we just heard, then, then what, what does it matter that you agreed with it? You're going you're gonna to get, get preached to. You're going to hear some things you need to do. It's not going to do you a bit of good until you start doing them. You won't be blessed until you start doing them. Say like what? Like reading your Bible. I think you ought to read that book every day. It says, blessed is he that readeth. Guys, I think you should read your Bible every day. Start at the beginning. Read through to the end. Start at the beginning. Read through the end. Start at the beginning. Read through to the end. Say, when can I quit? When you die or you hear a real loud trumpet. But until then, read the book and read the book and read the book. I can't get over how many times somebody, they get done with their Bible and they go, can I quit now? Yeah, you, yeah, quit reading the Bible and quit eating. 
Because I, I equate reading the Bible to eating. Now, let me ask you something. Did you have a big Sunday dinner today? It, this is my guess, my guess, because this is kind of like the fashion of our society. Isn't Sunday's noon meal kind of more elaborate and bigger than Monday's noon meal? Okay. You know what you get when you come to church? You have somebody prepare a large spiritual meal for you from this book. Then you read it on Monday, and you know what that is? That might be the bologna sandwich that you ate at lunch at work. Not the big meal that you had yesterday, correct? You don't get fed as well, maybe reading your Bible, as you did coming to church, but it keeps you alive. You know, I I have never wanted to preach a a life-changing message. You know what I want to preach on Sunday? I want to preach a message that has a, a, a moving effect until about Wednesday afternoon. And so everybody that got something can say, well, I need to go back Wednesday night. And if I happen to preach on Wednesday night, I hope it lasts all the way to Saturday night. Till they say, man, I can't wait till tomorrow and go, go back to church. Guys, you need to read this book. You say, well, what am I supposed to do? It says keep those things uh, that are written therein. Okay, this book says you ought to read it. You ought to read it. You know what this book says in Hebrews chapter 10? Forsake, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together. Now, you don't need that. It's those empty spots that need that. Isn't that true? But more and more, I'm telling you, people are finding more excuses. And they're all lame, and they're all soggy, and they're all sorry on why they won't make the midweek service. And here's how you quit, guys. Nobody quits the church by dropping off Sunday morning and coming Sunday night and Wednesday night. You drop off midweek service, then you drop off Sunday night service. There are people that went to their church for six months every Sunday morning who'd already left it six months ago. They're just waiting for the day when they finally shut the alarm off and didn't come. But guys, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Show up for church. I'm telling you, I like it. I lo- I've always loved being in church. And so as far as keeping those things and doing those things, read your Bible. Don't forsake the assembling. Giving and tithing. Now, I think tithing and giving. But if you don't believe in tithing, then give more than 10%. In case you're wrong. Because if you're wrong and you give 8%, You're going to go to heaven owing God 2% on your whole life. So I think you ought to tithe 10% and then give God. And and guys, you can't even give until you tithe. And wouldn't it be a terrible thing? You know, Kathy will do this, you know. We'll we'll have a check or something. uh, Or we we got a check. And uh, we'll go, did did we tithe that? I I can't remember if we tithed it or not. Well, let's just tithe it again. Well, wouldn't it be awful to get to heaven and find out she tithed something twice? I think I'd be blessed. I would be blessed to find out that I gave God 20% instead of 10%. But guys, giving is, and, and some of you, I mean, when it comes to giving, all of a sudden your arm, you're like, the, you're like the, uh, the tin man in Wizard of Oz, your arm rusts just as you're going for the wallet and you can't get it out. But that is where the fun starts. Pastor said it this morning again, you got missions, you can have part of these, uh, of these ministries by supporting them. And, and just more than prayer. Did you ever stop and think about this, guys? You go, well, I pray for the missionaries. Did you ever think about this? Um, Exodus chapter 17. And here is uh, the, the uh, Amorites are fighting with, uh, uh, with Israel. And remember, that's where Moses holds up his rod. And, and he held it up. And as long as he held it up, they had victory. What happened when his arms got tired and he dropped the rod? They started losing, right? So Aaron and Hur ran up to him and they said this to Moses. We're going to pray for you. And then they went back. Did you ever stop and think that if all they had said is we're going to pray for you, history would be written differently? Because Israel would have lost that battle. And there's times, guys, when you don't pray for them. Sometimes, I always say it this way, if you want to pray for some of these missionaries, write your prayer request on the back of a check for about 200 bucks. But give. It is always good to give. 2 Corinthians talks about giving. And it's a cheerful giver. And it's an opportunity, guys. It's an opportunity to to help somebody's ministry. So give. As far as keeping it, reading the Bible, forsaking not uh, not forsaking the assembly of yourselves uh, together, giving and tithing. How about this? Come out from among them and be ye separate. As I see our last days winding up, if there is anything that I see in the churches I preach in, it is a uh, a real resistance to not being part of the world. 
And I don't mean that our people are drinking and smoking and, and uh, living ungodly, but that world's got a real interest for, for us. I don't know if it's the internet. I don't know if it's the electronic age. I don't know exactly what it is, but I am telling you, I see people that love that world. And that book says, if you love the world, you're an enemy of God. You know what I tell folks? You might want to listen. If you have a favorite TV program, you know a favorite. Do this. Miss the next three episodes. Now, see, I cussed from the pulpit, didn't I? You say, well, then I won't. You won't what? You won't know what didn't happen. Right? You won't know what didn't happen on a program that was made up by some psycho. And, then, and, and you want to be like it? And you want to be like him? Guys, look, I am not, you have never come in this church and been, been, been given a list, but God's got a list. And it may be a different list for every one of you, but I'll tell you, some of you are going to try to do something. You know what the Holy Spirit's going to say? Don't do that. We were, uh, this was years ago. I think all three boys were still with us, so it was way years ago. And we had the first van and the trailer, and we were someplace out west, out in the middle of nowhere. One of those places where, like, from this point, there's a little berg about 50 miles, and beyond that, the next one is 50 miles. And we're Baptists. We eat regularly, like, on the hour. And we pulled in this little town, and, and there was a restaurant. And, and we got out of the van. It's about lunchtime, so we're ready for our fifth meal of the day. And we look like the little duck family. I'm in front, Kathy's in back, John's behind, behind her, Nathan's behind him, Luke's behind him. You know there is something wrong when you walk into a place and you can't see? I mean, did you ever see it so dark you can't see? You know, I have, a, I have a theory. I think I could close every bar in the state legally. All right, let me ask you this. Couldn't you drink booze in a well-lit room and get so drunk you'll fall over a table? then why do they allow them to sell it in a place that's dark where you could fall over a table if you're sober? Right? Did you ever fall over something in the dark when you were sober? Tell me, you were sober. <laughs> so why do they sell you something that disorients you in good light and they put it in the dark? And we walked into this place. I, it, did, it wasn't like Joe's Bar and Grill or anything. I don't remember what it was. But I walked in. And, and I walked in, and I'm telling you, I went, mm, I just stopped. And it was kind of like a train. Kathy, boom, 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 boom. You know, everybody's getting rear-ended. And I, it was like the Holy Spirit said, get out of here. You don't belong in here. I mean, I, didn't, I cannot tell you because we weren't in that place 15 seconds. I turned back around. I said, get out of here, family. We're not staying. Back out to the van. It was another 50, 60 miles before the next time we, we had a chance to eat. You say, well, why do you think God had you do that? I have no idea. I have no idea. I don't have to know. I have to obey. You know, some of you, you're going to do something. You know what God's going to say? You're not being honest when you say that. You're not doing right here. You shouldn't be making that phone call, and you shouldn't be, you shouldn't be downloading that. I mean, guys, at some point, you have got, the Bible does say, be ye separate, correct? And we have got, a, we have got Christianity that wants to look like the world and sound like the world. Uh, you know, I might have said this before. You know, it used to, they, we used to say that, that uh, the, the Christianity is the tail on the dog, and, and uh, you know, the world is up here, and, and we're like 25 years behind the world. We're not anymore. Not with the internet. Oh man, we're like 25 minutes and mad because of the lag time. We've got Christian young people, they can't stand the thought that they would find out tomorrow what came out today. They don't want their Christianity to make somebody think that they're cavemen. Hey guys, you can't have every toy you want. You can't do everything that you like. Let me tell you something. Uh, this is... Uh, a possibility. I'm not trying to find out. I might still like the taste of beer. I quit drinking 46 years ago when I got saved. I haven't had a beer in 46 years. But I didn't quit drinking because I didn't like the taste of it. I quit drinking because there was no glory to God in it. I might still like the taste. The reason I say that is because I hear people all the time, you know, uh, they listen to this, this, this 
I, I, was, uh, I was at a motel uh, a couple weeks ago, California. I'm on the third floor of a motel. I walk in Sunday afternoon. Now, guys, we know the Contempos have the drums and all this other stuff. I know that, and I know they have rock and roll music. But there was a meeting room down on the first floor, and it was, uh, the church name was Celebration. That's why everybody wants a party. Everybody wants to celebrate something. And, and as I walked down the hall, I mean the band let go. And it, it rocked my room three floors up. I was dancing in my sleep. But, um, and I thought, there is no way anybody can listen to that stuff and pretend that they're worshiping God. I don't care what you say. You cannot listen to that music. If you say we're worshiping God with that music, you are a liar. And that guy tell me, well, I like that kind of music. Who said you should listen to what you like? I mean, that's why the Lord came here, because there's just some things we like that don't belong in a Christian life. Isn't that true? You might like some of the jokes you used to tell. You might like some of the things you used to drink. You might like some of the places you used to go and like some of the things you used to watch. Nothing says you're going to quit liking it. He's just going to say, knock it off. You want to be blessed? Then keep what this book tells you. And it is going to tell you. Isn't it funny how we all say, I want God to speak to me, and as soon as he does, we go, you have to say that? Tell me, Lord, what you want me to do. Oh, you got a second choice. I, I believe I am right if I say this. Everybody in this room wants God to bless them. You came to church today. And, and believe me, the Lord laid this message on my heart yesterday. It has nothing to do with what the pastor preached this morning. And when the pastor got up this morning and talked about being blessed, I thought, oh, Lord, you're going to double, you're going to double barrel these people today. But this morning, now think about this. You want to be blessed, and you came to church, and the Lord had him preach this morning about how to be blessed and had somebody else preach on how to be blessed. And then you're going to walk out of here and say, why won't God bless me? Maybe you're not listening to what you've been preaching. Maybe you don't need a new revelation from God. Maybe you just need to act on the one you heard this morning. Or act on the one you heard tonight. Blessed is he that readeth. And they that hear the words of this prophecy. And keep those things which are written therein. For the time is at hand. I'd like you to stand with your heads bowed. Your heads bowed, your eyes closed. In just a moment I'll have a word of prayer. When I get done praying, the piano will begin to play. If the Lord has spoken to your heart this morning or tonight, if you know there's something you need to do, something you're not doing, not reading the book, not really putting your heart in the preaching, not willing to change your life for this God that you say you love, then I think you know what, what this invitation is for and what you need to do. Father, thank you for your goodness and thank you for your grace and thank you for church. Thank you so much. God, these folks didn't come for the pastor. They didn't come for me. They did. They did indeed come for you. They did indeed come because they wanted something from you. And God, I know they heard from you this morning. And I know you wanted this message preached. I might not have good, done a good job of it, but I know that you wanted this message preached tonight. So, Lord, that tells me that these people right here, you want to bless them. And there's somebody not getting blessed because they simply won't obey what they heard this morning, what they heard tonight. But if they will, they'll be blessed. And isn't that what we want? In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed as the instruments play, if you need to come and talk to the Lord, why don't you come? If you already know or knew before you, you came in here tonight what you needed to do, why don't you do what you know you should? Don't make a change in your life for success. We'll change anything for success. Make a change in your life because the Lord wants it made. Do something you don't want to do because you know it would please God. Quit doing something that you like because it's just something a Christian ought not to be doing. But you want to be blessed. There's still time to come if you need to come.
Let's go ahead and take our hymnals and turn to number 234. Let's sing that song, Wonderful Words of Life. Sing them over again to me, wonderful words of life. Let me more of their beauty see, wonderful words of life. Words of life and beauty. Wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Christ the Blessed One gives to all wonderful words of life. Sinner, list to the loving call, wonderful words of life. All so freely given, wooing us to heaven. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Sweetly echo the gospel call, wonderful words of life. Offer pardon and peace to all, wonderful words of life. Jesus, only Savior, sanctify forever. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, Wonderful words of life. If the Bible makes it clear that as believers we're involved in spiritual warfare. And when you're in battle, you can get wounded when the other side shoots at you. But as a pastor, my observation has been more often than not, in fact, the vast majority of times, when Christians are suffering from self-inflicted wounds, and we all understand sometimes we're our own worst enemy. It has nothing to do with the devil, has nothing to do with the world, anything else. Sometimes we just do it to ourselves. Almost without fail, if I'm talking to that person, trying to help them through that problem, sooner or later I'll ask them the question, are you in your Bible? And almost always the answer is what? No. And uh, I've come to the conclusion after close to 40 years uh, pastoring that, that most of the problems we have, now like I said, we can have problems that come from another direction, but most of the problems we have when, when we're doing it to ourselves, and by the way, that's how the devil tries to get us more often than not. You've heard me say it. The devil plays with smoke and mirrors. He deceives us, and a lot of times we'll do the damage ourselves. But almost without fail, if we'll just get in our Bibles and stay in our Bibles, God can direct us in such a way where we won't create the problem for ourselves. And I don't know about you, but uh, that's a big benefit to me. Because uh, more often than not, I'm the problem. And that book will straighten me out. So I appreciate what Pat, uh, Brother Gipp said tonight. I hope you'll take it to heart. If you're not in your Bible on a regular basis, find some way to do it. We keep putting those Bible calendars out. If that doesn't work for you, start in Genesis, read to Revelation, keep doing it. If that doesn't work for you, start in Revelation, go back to Genesis. I don't care how you do it. Just get in your Bible. You'll be blessed. Okay? That's what the Bible says. You'll be blessed. All right. Good night. You are dismissed.